So anyway, that's what I would say about that council, you know, yeah. uh, that that you know situation there with. Uh, but then Vigilius, he's the problem. Tell us about him. Yeah, Pope Vigilius by far. Orthodox listening, if you want to capitalize on the strength uh, of your side, this is it. This is, you know, uh, 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 a knockdown. Okay. I think we get up before 10, you know, before the referee counts to 10, but I, 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 we get knocked down here. Uh, pope Vigilius is a sitting pope. He's not dead. And he, uh, he publishes a few decrees. They're called constitua, constituta, consti constitutas. Um, and the first one, uh, it, you know, basically uh, it reiterates Chalcedon's judgment on a certain letter. The letter of Ebas of Edessa to Marie the Persian. Okay, for anyone listening, those details, you can search those details. Um, but then later on, he comes out with a second constitutum, basically saying the first one was wrong. And the language in the first one is powerful hmm. by the authority vested in the apostolic see, which is already an issue because why is he claiming that if he doesn't believe that he has the confidence? When did he live? This is, uh, so he was basically kidnapped from Rome uh, in 539, 540. And he was in Constantinople under house arrest for about nine years. So he was taken from Rome against his will because the emperor, you know, this is this is this is a huge history. I mean, this is one of my favorite parts of of early uh, church, you know, history. Uh, the Pope was under duress for nine years, basically in Constantinople. There have been a couple times he tried to escape. They dragged him back. Why did they drag him back? Why was he under house arrest at all? Good question. Good question. My answer to that is the is the emperor knew that without Rome's approval of his doctrinal scheme, um, it wasn't going to walk hmm. with two legs. I think he knew he needed to have the agreement of the West in order to make the policy that he was trying to enact with the Catholicus of the East. These are the, 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 the Miaphysites, the Emperor Justinian, that's who we're talking about. He was trying to unite the Miaphysites with the Catholics. Hmm. And, and, and part, part of doing that was sort of clearing up some confusion about the Council of Chalcedon. Well, not everybody was on board with Emperor's idea. Emperor Justinian, he was a theologian, so he thought he had the wherewithal to, to know what was going to solve the problem between the Coptics, you know, I call them that, that's, that's not what they called them at the time, but the Miaphysites and, and the Catholics, who were, you know, the five patriarchs. Rome wasn't on board initially. Eventually... Of Rome came on board, but it was through this enforcement. It was an, an imperial aggression. Uh, Justinian took Vigilius from Rome, sailed him back to Constantinople, and had him there until he finally gave way. Uh, but it was tough. Vigilius went back and forth. That's the issue. And he went back and forth with documents that claim the investment of Peter's authority. Hmm. So it's like, what do you do now? Now you got two documents. They both claim to be, you know, uh, uh, protected in some sense by the authority of Peter, um, but they contradict by the Pope's own admission. <laughs> so it's like, now what do you do? It almost looks like, a, you ever see those guns that shoot out a flag? The, the, you know, it's just a, it's yeah. a fake gun. It's like yeah. papal infallibility. Here's your bullet. Boom. And it was a failure. Um, the, the resolution there is that, I, and I, I go into detail on this in an article I have on academia.edu. So if you're interested, listeners are interested. We'll, we'll get a link before you yeah. go and put it in the description. I don't believe that the first constitutum uh, or the second constitutum really on its dogmatic axiom, on, on the point that he, on the point at hand, it was not a doctrinal matter. He was, con he was upholding Chalcedon's defense of a certain letter, and he realized that he applied it to the wrong letter. And once he realized, oh. no, Chalcedon was applying that to a different letter, see, then he came around and said, no, the letter was, I had the letter swapped. You know, there were some other issues there, but um, the dogmatic content was not 
theological. It, it was not. It was more an issue of whether Chalcedon's tenth session about a certain letter was going to be upheld or not. And so I don't think that it comes under the umbrella of faith and morals. Suppose it did. You Where know, would you be right now? Do you know what I'm saying? That's a good question. Yeah, yeah. I, I, if that was the case, I think, it, I think it would be a falsification event mm. of the Catholic Church. Yeah. Yeah, I remember, yeah, I mean, we say things like, well, if you could show me one, you know, infallible statement by a pope that contradicted a previous one, I'd have to give there up. You go. And I guess that's true. Um, yeah, so... But, it, but it, it, sometimes I, think, I think looking in at the Catholics, it sometimes feels like, uh, what do you need exactly to show that you're wrong here? Because every time I say, well, this pope said this and this was heresy, or he contradicted a previous infallible statement, well, technically, it's like we technically everything to death so that we can yeah. remain standing, it seems. Right, 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 which is un very uncomfortable, you know. On the other hand... But I guess you don't think that, though. Well, know. so for example, let's say let's say Pope Vigilius did have two ex-cathedra uh, mm -hmm. failures. <laughs> um what what's left there is not Greek conciliarism. What you I have see. is an imperially led, uh, you know, Caesaro Papist model. You know, Justinian was firing and hiring bishops at will hmm. who would go along with his you know program. That was the main issue. That's why Fagilius took nine years before. That's another. That's the other reason some Catholic scholars have said Vigilius was under duress, so no no decree under that time um, has any force because he was under duress. He, this was not a free, deliberate thing of mm -hmm. the Pope. I don't buy that, personally. I think that it, he was there for long enough. He was given quarter. He was given uh, a nice place to be. It wasn't like he was hooked up to chains. Um. But it's something to consider um, that, you know, this was not a free decision, perhaps, you know. Um, but uh, let's say Fagilius does disprove the papacy. I don't see this, like, collegial mm. uh, majority thing going on at that time. I see an emperor-driven program that mm -hmm. requires acceptance of the Caesaro Papist model, which doesn't exist anymore. So if Vigilius does disprove Catholicism, I don't see side by side Greek Orthodoxy. I see something, I see the Byzantine papacy in the person of the emperor. So now if that's something I'm going to convert to, I don't have anything to convert to. Mm. You know? So this is one of the reasons why some people look at this and they, you know, they, they, some people go Protestant because of this, because they they realize that historical narratives, uh, it's a broken compass. It, it it doesn't have a navigational clarity. You know, you've got one claim here, another claim here, two people going at it here. Um, there's no crisp like, oh, here's the map. This is what it is. There's like different maps. Everybody's going different directions. So that's one of the reasons why. Liberal scholarship went the way the way it did, because it it, it you know uh, it, it did it, it, what was going on between the fifth century to the Reformation. It, it's kind of variegated, you know. It's not just one story, you know. You've got all these this this whole Christian world in the East, far East. You've got the Christian world in Byzantium. You got the Christian world in the West, uh, um, and they're not all necessarily uh, an orchestra. If you all put them all together, it's like, ah, you know, there's no orchestra. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, it, you know, it, sometimes people look past, uh, to the past and they, they don't see historical coherence. And so they don't think his, history is a compass to, 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 to search for their journey. So they'll go to the Bible. You know, well, the, the Bible is what doesn't have any. Yeah. yeah. But then, see, that's 17th, you know, 17th, 18th century, Enlightenment and all that. They realize, well, the Bible itself is God incoherence you see and um so the bible itself is not a compass with which you know it, you've got two isaiah writers you got five writers of the pentateuch you've got i mean there's all kinds of things that to pick apart you know speaking of all the technicalities to maintain our position as a catholic anybody who believes in biblical inerrancy you've got a, a big job 
to do, um, defending biblical inerrancy, the traditional view of infallibility of the of the text of Scripture. Uh, Christians, we we have work to do one way or the other. If you want to be a Christian, you, you have you're going to find yourself uncomfortable under criticism, uh, and, and you're not always going to have uh, you know uh, uh, a knock them down, drag them out answer for everything. So what's the the swing back? I guess we're talking about all these kind of you know yeah. uh, troubling things. So what would the the swing back be? Either you know, well just thoughts on this or like things that have, that you, bolster confidence. Yeah, because at this point you're like shit. Maybe we should just be atheists. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, well, look, Vigilius. Number one, Justinian wanted Vigilius's agreement because he knew that Rome had the authority to to make this some sort of official. You know. So even though there was uh, this fiasco, there was already a a recognition of the papacy, I think, in Justinian. Vigilius himself obviously thinks that he Mm -hmm. has the authority to decide the matter um, because this is one of the points that Father Richard Price, a phenomenal patristic scholar, he translated many of the ecumenical councils into English. He brings up this point that Vigilius felt he had the investment divinely through Peter and the succession from Peter to do these things. He's backed up by predecessors who have the same view. Um, The Council of Ephesus announces the theory that Christ bestowed to Peter the keys of the kingdom and that that invested Peter's successors stationed in Rome with binding and loosing powers over doctrine and discipline. So you have this preceding history, repetitive history, of, of testimony. Um, you have Agilius himself. And then when you see what happened after the fact, okay, Rome is still being defended. What happened in 681? Did people say, oh, remember that Vigilius event? So I guess we don't rely on Rome anymore. No, they relied on Rome again with, with the Council of Constantinople III. How about uh, the Council of Nicaea II with images, the doctrine of the veneration of images. Do they say, oh, well, we have Honorius, we have Vigilius, we have Liberius. Maybe those claims are not right. No, they rehearsed them. So you see that it survived. So if it survived, there's reason to believe it survived for a reason. And if it survived for a reason, what reason is that? Um, and it seems as it was instrumental, like I said, in the uh, in protecting the the faith, the Christian faith, so the Pope is right there with the protection of the Christian faith for the first ten centuries, even with some of these death defying, mul- uh, you know, mm. events. They're mulligans, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so I, I I don't see you know I, I I'm not of the view that oh look at these things that happened these these terrible events. Therefore, Eastern Orthodoxy. I can't do that because I have to. I have to test Eastern Orthodoxy by the same critical, coherent consistency. If it doesn't have patristic backing, if it doesn't have patristic coherence, I can't just say, "Well, if not Rome, then Byzantine." Byzantine. You know, I can't do that. You know, especially with the Vigilius event. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Please be sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment below letting us know what you thought about the video.